Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Richardson Sloan Special Collection Center of the Davenport Public Library's presentation on the history and architecture of Davenport along the Quad City Times Big Seven race route. My name is Katie Reinhardt. I'm the Special Collections Librarian, and I will be your guide for this part two from Kirkwood Boulevard and to McClellan Heights. Uh, part one covered just the Brady Street Hill, and you can view that on our on the library's YouTube channel. Um, we'll start with the home that we last saw at the end of part one on the corner of Kirkwood and Brady Street, number 1527. This is an example of Italian eight architecture in residential architecture that we discussed some in part one. And I'll just point out again that that's characterized by the uh, heavy hip roof that uh, and the eaves are supported by double brackets. And there are rounded windows with uh, cornices that are sometimes split, but they're they have a decorative hood. And uh, this particular example has been, was updated with some uh, later Victorian elements, such as the wraparound porch and the gingerbread work at the top and the, uh, the fan shapes around the, at the tops of the porch area. So if you turn on to Kirkwood Boulevard from here, you can see it's a long avenue. It runs from Brady Street all the way through to Jersey Ridge Road to the east in Davenport. It's the longest portion of the road race course. It's, it's 1.7 miles. And it was the first boulevard that was planned at the turn of the 20th century in Davenport. It's named for Samuel J. Kirkwood, who was the governor of Iowa during civil, the Civil War. And between Perry and Pershing Streets, there was a Civil War camp. Uh, so that has those Civil War connections. Um, it was once lined with beautiful elm trees, but those succumbed to the Dutch elm di disease in the 1960s, though neighborhood groups have done their best to uh, beautify the boulevard in different ways. These are some examples of postcard views from the Richardson Sloan Special Collections Center's collections. Here's a view of the corner of Iowa and Kirkwood Streets, Kirkwood, Iowa Street and Kirkwood Boulevard, which is also the location of the first Presbyterian church. This was designed and built in 1898 to 19, to 1899 by Frederick Clausen and Park Burroughs. They were uh, a dynamic du duo of Davenport architecture. They were partners between 1896 and 1904. And we have already discussed them a little bit um, in the Brady Street portion of the presentation. They also designed the Renwick Building and the Argyle Flats Apartments and St. John's Methodist Church. In designing this church, they were heavily influenced by Boston architect Henry Hobson Richardson, who had a special take on the revival of Romanesque style elements. Um, he fused uh, more of a classicism with in plan with a um, with the elements of the, the Romanesque 
early medieval cathedral building styles. Um, and you can see that in Clausen and Burrow's work here with the rusticated stone, the uh, very heavy feeling uh, and the rounded arches and the kind of stumpy uh, columns that are used. This is a portrait of Park Burroughs um, from our J.B. Hostetler collection of images that were originally purchased by uh, Frank Free, whose home and studio we, we also discussed in part one. So other examples of Richardsonian Romanesque architecture include the Davenport City Hall and the Schmidt block where the Duck City restaurant is today. The first uh, house we're gonna discuss here along this, along Kirkwood Boulevard is number 623. It's the W.S. Cameron House built in 1880. And it's an important example of a very local vernacular style developed by builder, architect, and carpenter, T.W. McClelland. Um, he was active from the 1850s all the way through the 1880s, uh, all the way through the 1900s. Um, early 1900s. So his particular style was to have, um, a, uh, it was a front gable with usually three stories and three bays of windows with a porch. Um, and you can see that those broken cornices that were part of the Italianate style. This again has been updated a little bit with a porch in the, in the later Victorian style of Queen Anne. And this is a, an ad for T.W. McClellan's company um, from the city directories in the 1880s, particularly colorful one. So the owner of the house, W.S. Cameron, was a um, clothing businessman. Um, hats and men's furnishings. This is number 616, the Ball Waterman House, built in 1880 for J.W. Ball, who uh, is not really that notable, except for he was an active member of the Methodist Episcopal Church. The style is late Queen Anne, and the Queen Anne style is uh, one of the most popular Victorian styles for residences. And um, the key word here you need to know is verticality, which was emphasized by pointed gables that went in different directions and often towers, square in this case, often rounded. Uh, so there were multiple different types, roof types, that were amassed. Um, and also very important is the use of applied decoration in millwork. Um, so all of the balustrades and the, and the little de Tudor decorations on the tower that you can see, um, those are typical of the Queen Anne style. 
And this has the cresting on the tower, the ironwork that we saw in the uh, in Dr. Keck's uh, infirmary on Brady Street in the earlier portion. So the Tudor revival elements combined with the Queen Anne, which also includes this, the um, projecting bay windows um, and, and obviously wood frame construction with all that wood millwork. The, the Tudor elements um, are the half timbered look. This is the Thomas Murray house built in 1881 number 628. Uh, just back for a moment to the, the Ball Waterman house. It, the notable owner of, of that house was, um, was Judge Charles McGee Waterman, who was a Supreme Court Justice for the state of Iowa. Um, and he was also the founder of the, the firm Lane and Waterman. So again, this is the Thomas Murray house. He was a city engineer and was responsible for pl platting most of the subdivisions in the growing city in the late part of the 19th century. He also was responsible for paving the roads. Um, his house is an Italianate in basic form with the hip, hip roof and the the bracketed eaves. Um, again, um, updated to the Queen Anne style with the uh, scalloped design underneath the eaves and underneath the eave of the porch. And the balustrades along the porch and of course the, the colors. So that kind of straddles the two, two styles, Italianate and Victorian Queen Anne. Number 636 Kirkwood Boulevard is the first Church of Christ Scientist built in 1912 by the firm of Clausen and Clausen. That was the elder Clausen, uh, Frederick, and his son, Rudolph Clausen. This is done in a straight ahead neoclassical style with Doric columns and a full entablature. Um, in 1980, the Harvest Time Family Worship Center took over the building, um, and that had been founded by the Reverend James and Cecilia Lee. And that's Mr. Lee here with another view from a photograph in our collection. Across the street at number 702 to 12 to 712 are uh, four unit, four apartments in a row house. Um, and these were designed in the English Tudor style that was very popular after the turn of the 20th century. And the more recent photo on the right, uh, you see they, they've painted over the half timbering with a light brown paint. But that's, the, that's what characterizes it as Tudor style. This is number 804, the William Holbrook house. It is clearly the Queen Anne style with its front tower, it's high gables, all the scalloped shingle work, 
and the dentrils and fan shapes along the uh, under the eaves of the porch. Holbrook was a furniture and a carpet dealer. This is number 1011, the Benjamin Nyswander House, built in 1896. Also in the Queen Anne style, with a little tower and the L-shaped plan with the gables. Uh, most unusual about this is that beautiful um, curved roof um, that overhangs the porch. Number 1112 is the J.B. Hostetler house. Hostetler is, was a photographer in the 19 teens into the 20s who, whose collection of glass plate negatives are held by us at the center. Um, he lived here with, and his daughter Roberta, Roberta, Roberta was also, um, inherited, she had inherited her father's artistic ability and she was active in the, in the art league and, and other artistic groups in Davenport. This is an image from the 1857 Lambane and Hol Lambach and Holgain map that shows uh, the area of Kirkwood Boulevard between Bridge and Mound Street. And this is a top topographical map by um, Melchior Huvinger from 1893 that shows that after Bridge Street, the, the uh, topography changes and between Bridge and Mound Street, uh, it's, it's very, it dives down into a valley, valley and the, the area that would become the extension to Kirkwood Boulevard is very twisty and turny. At the corner of College Avenue and Kirkwood Boulevard is the um, is the first house that was built as part of the early 1950s prefabricated housing development created by uh, Mel Foster Sr. There are several houses along Kirkwood Boulevard between um, Bridge and Eastern Avenues. These were very modest, simple homes with just two bedrooms. Um, the design was called Pullman after the designer and they were, um, they were prefabricated by a company in Toledo, Ohio. And as you, as you continue along the boulevard, you can see the back end of the Pierce School lofts. Um, that was once the Pierce School. Uh, built in 1900 by Claussen and Burroughs, again. 
It's on 2212 East 12th Street in the village of East Davenport. It's a, it's a basic four square in shape uh, with a hipped roof built of Milwaukee brick. And it's a combination of Richardsonian style with those round arched arcades and more neoclassical features like the, uh, the triangular pediment. And as you hit the intersection with between Kirkwood and Jersey Ridge Road, there is a building with a florist and a vape shop, I believe, that you can see some of the vestiges of the McClellan Heights Presbyterian Church that was there on the corner of Fulton and Jersey Ridge. And then this is the Christie House, which is uh, back next to the Pierce House, which you can maybe see from the back as well. The Pierce um, School, I mean, that you can maybe see from from the back. It's also an Italianate with the cupola on top and the bracketed eaves. That's at 2224 12th Street. So then you turn up Middle Road. This is number 2414, which is a typical American craftsman style bungalow. And once you turn into McClellan Boulevard, you are officially in McClellan Heights. Uh, these two images show the area. The first one is the 1888 bird's eye view of Davenport. You can see Jersey Ridge Road, the very last road, and then McClellan Heights area is just represented by those kind of just stylized mountain hills in the background. Uh, but from the 1893 Hubinger topographical map, uh, you can see uh, you can see the the uh, elevation and and of the camp. The land there had belonged to the Allen family for many years. And at around the turn of the century, uh, Charles Reed tried to work with the heirs of Mr. Allen to, to secure this land for a new subdivision, a new development, which he finally did despite a proposal to turn it into a park as well, because it had been the site of one of Iowa's most important Civil War camps. And here you can see the development was platted out along the lines of the topography that you could see in the 1893 map. Uh, it wasn't just a grid imposed, it was meant to take advantage of the hilly location for residences that would be removed from the downtown area of Davenport to be in a park-like setting. And here is some of the advertising for the Kent McClellan Land Company owned by Charles Reed. Um, And I think some of the descriptions are amusing. It is a casket of verdure placed on the shores of the transparent waters over which is spread that magical view of a matchless horizon and the immense 
amphitheater of heaven. So <laughs> that was the place to build your house in the early 20th century Davenport. Um, and again, its selling points had to do with the fact that there were no old houses, no saloons, no little corner stores that you might find in the, in the downtown area of Davenport. There were all different kinds of architecture. Uh, most, of the, most of the houses were actually built in the 1920s. Uh, and pretty much every type imaginable, many of them based on English styles of rural housing. This is called the Cots Cotswold Cottage at number 323 McClellan Boulevard. And that was uh, that was after um, imitation. That was in imitations of cottages found in the Cotswolds region of England. Number three hundred one is the Dasa Evans House. This is in a totally different style, which. Uh, was called Mediterranean, and that's marked by um, the use of stucco, the use of tiled roofs, and in this case, a tripartite arcade uh, with, with spiraled columns perched up above the roadway here. Number 108 McClellan Boulevard, the John Hayes House uh, has a similar style. It's also a central pavilion in the, in the front with a th three window arcade, uh, very uh, low hipped roofs um, built up like a temple in the Mediterranean style. Um, the difference with this one is that it was built, it's actually a wood frame construction, doesn't have the stucco, um, and it has a kind of a yellowish brown brick veneer. Um, back a little ways is the Raymond G. Cundy house. Uh, Cundy was a, just an influential Quad Cities businessman and investor. And at the time of his residence in McClellan Heights, he was the vice president of the Priester, Quayle and Cundy firm. And in 1927, he became the head of the Moline Manufacturing Company. Um, if you look through the newspapers, his wife, Mrs. Cundy, was very, very active in the society of uh, McClellan Heights and of, and of upper class Davenport in general. And just to mention that those Mediterranean style houses, the Dasa Evans house, Evans was actually a the inventor of a device called the neurocolometer, which was a heat sensing instrument that was used in the chiropractic. It was promoted in the 20s by B.J. Palmer. Number 26 was the house of Cyrus Darling, whose portrait by Hostetler in our collection is on the right side. This is another uh, craftsman style home. 
it was and Darling was a a contractor at the time he lived here and is typical of the fact that many residents of the area of McClellan Heights were in the lumber or the building trades. Number 20 McClellan Boulevard is another style. This one is the American Colonial Revival. And this is another house for whom our collection of Hostetler portraits. Uh, this of Mrs. Thomas Griggs and her daughter Elizabeth lived in this craft, craftsman style home. And this home was probably based on the pre cut kit style homes that could be purchased in the teens and 20s, well, on into the 40s, actually. Um, it looks something like this uh, Gordon Van Tyne home. And Gordon Van Tyne was, of course, the mail order company for plans and building materials that was located right here in Davenport. Number 25 is the Seth Temple House, built in 1908, one of the earliest residents of the McClellan Heights area. Uh, compared to the homes to the east that along River Drive that he and his partner, uh, Park T. Burroughs, built, this was rather plain. Um, it's just a squarish stucco home with some craftsman style elements to it. And it's the same Park Burroughs who was with um, Frederick Clausen. Uh, who now was partnered up with Seth Temple to build Oak Knoll, which is the first house to the east, a uh, Tudor style house uh, belonging to John J. Reimers and his family. He was a lumber industry investor. His wife was one of the Denkmans, or also probably the most important regional lumbering family. And their home was called Oak Knoll. The address was 5 McClellan Boulevard, faced out over the Mississippi River and was a uh, Tudor style, uh, very horizontally oriented to get to maximize the views of the river. And on the west side were a beautiful circular garden designed by uh, landscape architect Jen Jensen, Jens Jensen. Now on the way back down Kirkwood Boulevard and Brady Street from McClellan Heights, I just wanted to, uh, to correct something I said about the Mrs. Renwick residence, the residence of, um, of uh, Margaret and Rebecca Renwick. Uh, this was, this is in fact on Brady Street. Uh, I just didn't realize it at first because the porch is oriented south. Uh, it's not facing Brady Street itself. So this was another Italianate home. It's much changed. Um, 
it's become apartments over the years. And another one I left out of the Brady Street portion of the tour was the Hill and Frederick's Mortuary on no, at 1229 Brady Street. This was built in 1929 and is uh, neoclassical in form. And here's some views going south on Brady Street from the WOC station at Palmer. More of our postcard collection. And an earlier view from 9th Street. Uh, this is an advertisement for Edward Hammett, who was from the city directories. He was Again, the architect of Trinity Church that was built for in honor of Ebenezer Cook by her by by his wife um, Clarissa Cook, also the benefactress of the first public library in the city. And Hammett was also the architect of the Wieneke and Eagle blocks in the 300 block of Brady Street. So now we turn the corner from Brady to onto East Third Street. Here we see the Nabstedt Jewelers in an Italianate building on the Left side on the right is the Union Savings Bank that was built um, in the classical revival style. Uh, the bottom part, which you see here, was built in 1915, and then the upper floors were added in the mid 20s. And then the major renovation into the Union Arcade occurred in the mid 40s. This is a postcard showing some of the businesses on the south side of East Third Street, uh, starting with the Union Savings Bank on the right. And in the middle, you can see the F.T. Schmidt and Sons building and that's another example of the Richardsonian Romanesque style with the round arches over the windows. It's now the Duck City restaurant. And this is a photograph of the northwest corner of Third and Perry Streets from 1941 could see some of the businesses that were there then. Uh, and this is the same view at night showing the Mississippi Hotel and the RKO Orpheum Theater. And these are two views from, from Pershing Street of the Black Hawk, the back of the Black Hawk Hotel. Um, from the 40s on the left and from the 50s on the right. So, uh, and then the finish line is at the end of East Third Street. Uh, congratulations for making it. Again, if you have any questions about the architecture and history that you've seen along the route of the BIC 7 race, you're welcome to contact me, Katie Reinhardt, anytime at the Main Street branch of the Davenport Public Library. And I thank you again for joining me.